probably going to be a little more challenging to uh, our eyelids than the first. You got that food in ya. It's Saturday afternoon. So, all right, we'll try to keep a good pace and keep going as we look at the Abrahamic covenant. These four key points in the Abraham narratives, again, the whole purpose of this being to give you the basic information and, and a sketch of what God is doing with Abraham. And if we're not giving, obviously, a full walkthrough of each text, I'm just hitting the high points so that you can have the basic information in your mind, which may already be there, um, but so that then when we get to the next section and we say, all right, what contribution does the Abrahamic covenant make to redemptive history? We're able to pull on what we know God and Abraham did before drawing, you know, some some big picture implications. So let's just look at these last two events. Number three, where God confirms the covenant with the sign of circumcision. Um, again, I think it'll be profitable just to maybe read through these passages. So who would like to read Genesis 17? in the first 16 verses, which takes place several years after the events of Genesis 15. All right, Jeremiah. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will raise nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee, in their generations. This is my covenant, which he shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah, Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Alright, very good. All right, so what we have here then is God confirming the covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 12, he comes to Abraham and he says, "Come out. You're going to be you're going to be mine. I'm going to I'm going to make a promise at least with you and and your descendants to come." In Genesis 15, he begins to in Genesis 13 fill in the details of that promise. You're going to have many children. I'll make you into a great nation. You will you will inhabit this land forever. This will this will be your territory. Um, I will be your God. You will be my people. And all you must do is believe in, in what I'm telling you and embrace me as your covenant God. And you'll be made right with me. And you'll enjoy all these things. And then God ratifies it with with the ceremony of walking between the the cut animals. So now God is coming to Abraham years later. And he is giving to him a sign, a sign for this covenant community, the sign of circumcision. Now here we do see the Lord beginning to lay some stipulations on Abraham. So according to verse 1, what is it that Abraham must do? 
Walk before the Lord. Yep, and blamelessly. That's right. Walk before me uh, faithfully and be blameless. Another one of, I think, the translation in the authorized version is walk, walk before me and be thou perfect. All right, so the idea of, of perfection there um, as this wholeness. Here's from my notes. Walk before me expresses the service and devotion of a faithful servant to his king. Uh, be blameless or perfect. Harkens back to Noah in Genesis 6, 9 and refers to the high moral walk that God's people strive after. God is calling Abraham to be morally blameless and impeccable, honest and sincere in the covenant relationship. I don't see here an echo of the covenant of works. I don't, I don't want to build too much on perfect there where, where God is putting before him the covenant of works so that he'll then transfer his faith. We've already seen Abraham believe. I think what you have here is this idea of, of impeccable moral faithfulness. Now, obviously, perfection is is the ultimate goal there. But I don't think it's necessarily a call to that perfect obedience so much as the moral uprightness, the blamelessness, what what we read about Noah being you know perfect in his generations and wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. We have a reference to the covenant in verse 2. I will make my covenant between me and you. You may remember I said when we were in Genesis 15, the Lord said, I will cut the covenant, carath the covenant. Here we have a different word, uh, not carath, but what is that word? Uh, Nathan, I will give my covenant to you. I think God is just saying the covenant that's already been cut in Genesis 15, this is the covenant I'm preserving that I'm establishing. We're continuing what we started here in Genesis 15. Again, it's been many years since Genesis 15. So the Lord is coming and reminding him of the covenant, not introducing a new one. And apparently that's a debate. I didn't even know that was an open discussion, but are there two covenants in view between 15 and 17, or is it one? I'm just going to go with one for now, because I, I haven't even had the chance to look into that. And, and on the surface, don't see, a, don't see any reason to side with that. What God promises to do in verse 2b is greatly increase Abram's, Abraham's numbers. Referring again to the covenant then in verse 4a. Again we come back to what God promises to do in verses 4b through 6. He will make Abraham the father of many nations. He will give him a new name in fact. He will make Abraham fruitful. He will make kings come from Abraham. Again verse 7 a reference to the covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. Verse 8, God again promises, I will give you the land of Canaan and to your descendants, and I will be their God. When we get to verses 9 to 14, we read what Abraham must do. He must receive circumcision and give it to all of the male descendants. So th this mark is to characterize everybody associated with Abraham. Everybody, uh, God has put his name on this person, on his household, on his descendants. God has claimed him for himself. You are mine. And therefore, uh, the sign of that is, must also be worn by all of the male descendants in Abraham's household. It's the sign of the covenant. And then again, verses 15 through 16, God promising to make Sarah the mother of nations and kings, and again, giving to her a new name. So we've got the call out of Haran. We've got him settling into the land, but then parting with Lot. We've got God promising him, even though you can't have the good land right now because of Lot, and there's going to be a time period where your slaves in Egypt, this is your land, and I'm going to be your God. And now you're going to be my people, and you're going to have a lot of people descending from you, and I'm going to make your name great, and you're going to be marked by this sign. You're my people. So then, Ab uh, fourth event, chapter 22. Not actually going to read um, the whole passage there, but this is the fourth event where Abraham's obedience is confirmed. Um, the Abraham's obedience and confirmation of the promises by oath. Here God comes to Abraham and tests him to see if he will indeed walk before him and be perfect. When he says in verse 1 of chapter 22, uh, verse 22, etc., excuse me. God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Here, Abraham is tested. Will he walk before God 
and be blameless. Now verses 1 through 14 tell us uh, the narrative about him doing that and how he does indeed faithfully respond to the call of God. Now, when he passes the test, then we see God promising him things again. So could somebody just read me verses 15 through 18 of chapter 22? Um, Owen, yeah, go ahead. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. How far do you say? Uh, an 18 also, please. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Very good. So, Abraham must walk before God and be faithful, and God, because Abraham is faithful, promises, I will bless you, I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will conquer their enemies, and I will bless all nations on earth through your seed. So now, let's take the data. Let's try to say, okay, based on those texts themselves, and we're going to bring in some New Testament commentary, what contribution does this covenant make to redemptive history? All right, first and foremost, the Abrahamic covenant creates the first visible covenant community. The covenant with Abraham creates the first visible covenant community. The very word for nation in the Hebrew Old Testament, goy, it refers to an organized community of people having governmental, political, and social structures. All right? to be, just to be a nation, to be a people, is to be an organized, visible community with these structures. So, contrast Genesis 1 through 11 with what follows, beginning with Abraham in Genesis 12. In Genesis 1 through 11, God's people can be identified with the descendants of Adam's son Shem. So notice sometime when you're reading those chapters, notice how Shem's descendants are contrasted with Cain's in Genesis 4 through 5. Okay, that's the point of those genealogies there. Cain's line is traced until Tubal Cain, a cruel man who kills a young man in revenge for personal injury, verses 22 through 25 of chapter 4. Shem's line is, cha is traced until Noah. And includes within it Enoch and then perhaps Noah's son Shem also. So after the fall of man and the birth of Cain and Abel and the slaughter of Abel by Cain, we have this tracing of the descendants of Adam and Eve. Cain's descendants culminating in a wicked man. And then Shem, the new son giving, his descendants culminating in a righteous man. That's the point of that history there in chapters 4, 5, and 6. We're, we're tracing out the seed of the woman and the seed of of the serpent, the godly versus the ungodly. So they're descending through this particular line. However, after God's covenant with Abraham, there is an identifiable covenant community complete with a covenant sign. The very structure of Genesis bears witness to this difference. Genesis 1 through 11 covers thousands of years of human history and brings the reader right up to Abraham. And then the narrative slows down and spends the remaining chapters of Genesis, 12 through 50, focusing on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Here is the visible covenant community where God is putting his name. And for the first time, we've got an identifiable group of people who bear the name of their God. They have the name, they have the sign, they have the structure. They're, they're the covenant community. Number two, the Abrahamic covenant becomes the basis for God's subsequent redemptive actions. The Abrahamic covenant becomes the basis for God's subsequent redemptive actions. Meaning this, God repeatedly shows mercy to disobedient Israel because of his faithfulness to the Abrahamic covenant covenant. Listen to Exodus 32.12. I'll read these. Wherefore should, this is after um, the sin of the golden calf, 
Moses saying, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, From mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed. And they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Exodus 20, 32, 12 to 14. And I, it, I've got a whole host of references in my notes to later generations invoking this promise and saying, this Lord is why you should be merciful to us. This is why you should continue your redemptive purpose. It's all grounded in this Abrahamic covenant. It's the basis of for everything subsequent. In fact, this is not a separate point. This is, this is on to that same point. What God does in Christ is said to fulfill the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. What God does in Christ fulfills the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Again, this is that same second point, that it's the basis of subsequent redemptive actions. Listen to Luke 1, 54-55. Mary saying, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This is Mary's song after uh, learning that, that she is going to be the, the handmaiden of the Lord to bear, to bear God's son. And after she's spoken with Elizabeth and Elizabeth's baby has leaped in her womb and they're rejoicing over what God is doing, Mary's saying, God has helped us in fulfillment of the promises that he gave to Abraham. Look also at Luke 1. Oh, come on. Stop doing that. Verse 68. Uh, this is Zechariah, after he finally could speak again. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So notice again, what God does in Christ fulfills the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. You might want to just jot these other references such as Acts 3, verses 25 to 26, Romans 15, verses 8 through 9, and Galatians 3, verses 13 to 14. Third, the Abrahamic covenant establishes the priority of faith in one's relationship with God. The Abrahamic covenant establishes the priority of faith in one's relationship with God. We read Galatians 3 earlier, so who could just read me the first five verses of Romans 4? Yes, Owen. Romans 4, 1 to 5. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Amen. And good. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. All right. And earlier you may remember us reading Galatians 3, 16 to 18, where Paul was making the point that the law, which came after the promise to Abraham, doesn't alter the nature of how God enters into a right relationship with his people. It's very interesting that the temporal priority of Abraham's faith proves that salvation is by faith. It, faith precedes the giving of the law. The very shape given to the Old Testament narrative, what we would call its canonical shape, reveals that salvation is received by 
faith alone. Now this, this of course, interacts with James chapter 2, where we actually read this phrase in verse 24, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. It's actually the only time in Scripture that the word faith alone occurs. And don't think if you're debating with somebody from an Orthodox or Catholic tradition that they're not going to refer to that verse. See, you guys say faith alone. Yeah, here's the one place it occurs when we're told it's not <laughs> by faith alone. And to that you say, well, absolutely. That is what, that is what the Scripture says. Uh, Genesis, James 2 is interesting not only because unlike Paul, Referring to Genesis 15, James also appears to Abraham as his example, appealing to Genesis 22, what we just read with uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, and therefore saying that here's where his faith was completed and made perfect. I, you know, I, we don't have time to work through James 2. I do think it's very interesting that in verse 14, this is, this is the path I usually take, um, the question, what good is it, my brothers? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? There is a definite article in the Greek text before faith there. It's can the faith save him? And I think it's an article referring to the faith he was just discussing. Can a faith that is without work save anybody? And the answer is no. Faith begins the work of God and accomplishes our justification. It is proven, completed, made mature, by our works. They are the means by which we give expression to our faith. Faith indeed does work and that through love. But just as Hebrews 11 talks about this hall of fame of faith throughout the Old Testament, what is the means by which all those people were justified according to Hebrews 11? By faith. By faith. By faith. And then the record is given of the deeds they did by faith. So I just you can't get around that prioritizing of faith uh, any you know there in scripture Hebrews 11 and James 2 included and then of course you start with these with these foundational texts of Romans 4 and Galatians 3 where Paul is saying look he, faith comes before the law works cannot justify they can't play any role in us receiving the righteousness of God because long before there was any law given God had justified Abraham by faith the very shape of the Old Testament testifies to that reality. And number four, we actually hinted at this, but, but let's, let's return to it here. The realities of the Abrahamic covenant find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. The realities of the Abrahamic covenant find their ultimate reality, fulfillment in Christ. Christ is the seed of Abraham, Galatians 3.16. The Abrahamic covenant preaches the gospel, Galatians 3.8. New Testament believers are Abraham's children. Galatians 3.29, Romans 4.11-12. through 12. It's significant that when we get into the New Testament, Paul calls the promise given to Abraham, and these shall all nations be blessed, he calls that the gospel. And he says the gospel was preached to Abraham. The ultimate seed of all those children is Christ. And when we, in the New Testament, believe in him, we tap into that family and become Abraham's children. We'll talk about this in a few minutes, but again, I think that's where you start seeing you know, these redefinition of terms such as Israel. I mean, who is Israel? Israel is the people of God. Started, yes, with a nation, but Gentiles being grafted in, telling us that when God speaks of Israel, he speaks of his covenant people those who believe in him. We fulfill what Israel was intended to be in the New Testament. That's all I have on the Abrahamic covenant. Any questions there? All right. Let's talk about the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant. Benjamin. What before me without perfect is that means no, I would see that as obedience. You know, obey me, walk before me, be morally upright. Um, Genesis six nine is same word. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Or uh, another way of reading it, um, 
That's the same. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. So I, th I think it's saying, you have believed in me, now I want you to obey me. And I want you to walk before me. I want you to do what I tell you to do. First and foremost, circumcise your family. Years later, offer your only son to me. So is that an uh, act of acting of the faith? Mm -hmm. I would think so, because you do have the faith. Previous chapters. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, a condition in the sense that obviously there's things required, but yeah, you do have the covenant established by faith, and then years later, God's saying, you know, there is this role of obedience. So, good observation. All right, Mosaic covenant. Let's give a definition. This is the covenant that God made with Israel after rescuing them from Egypt and bringing them to Mount Sinai. The covenant God made with Israel after rescuing them from Egypt and bringing them to Mount Sinai. This covenant defines the relationship between God and Israel. Abraham has gone from being a big family, basically, to now being a nation. Uh, this defines the relationship between God and Israel. And it occupies a central place in the Old Testament material. Most of the Old Testament is devoted to this covenant, the Mosaic covenant covenant. It's also the covenant most frequently contrasted with the New Covenant when we get to the New Testament. Um, the New Testament often refers to the Mosaic Covenant as the Old Covenant. So most of the contrasts that we're going to read about in the New Testament between Old and New are between the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant that, that Jesus instituted in the Last Supper. We read about the institution of the Mosaic Covenant in Exodus chapters 19 through 24. We're not going to read all five chapters. We'll probably read in a minute um, chapter 24. In chapter 19, you have the offer and acceptance of the covenant. In chapters 20 through 23, you have the terms of the covenant. And that could be broken down into chapter 20, where we have the ten words of the ten commandments. In chapters 21 through 23, we read about the judgments, the statutes. And in chapter 24, we have the ratification of the covenant. So, uh, there in chapter 19, God says, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you to me on eagle's wings. Walk before me. Uh, keep the terms of the covenant. This is the covenant that I am offering to you, to which they said all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Then God says, therefore, chapter 20, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Get into the ten words. And then by the, and go through all these various laws. And then we get to chapter 24, where God calls them up unto the mountain. And they have this covenant ratification ceremony. Let's, let's read chapter 24. Let's read the first eight verses. Who, who would read 24, 1 to 8? Andrew. <coughs> And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and rose up early in the morning, and builded an altar under the hill, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said will we do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Alright, so here's the covenant ratified, put into place with the sacrifice and the blood. Let's talk just for a moment on how central the Mosaic covenant is in the Old Testament. If you were to take the Pentateuch and break down these first five books of the Bible. In Genesis, we have in many ways the historical prologue to the Mosaic covenant. We read about the institution of the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When we get to the book of Exodus, we read about the redemption of Israel from Egypt, and in fulfillment of those promises, the Mosaic covenant is instituted. 
We're given our instructions for tabernacle worship. When we get into the book of Leviticus, we have institutions for sacrifices, priesthood, and life in the land of Canaan. In the book of Numbers, we have continued instruction for Israel, such as the census, tabernacle instructions, various other laws. You have the failed attempt to enter the promised land and 40 years of wilderness wandering for unbelief. And then in Deuteronomy, the repetition of the covenant as Israel prepares to enter the promised land. This, this is the covenant. These are the books of the covenant. This, this is the agreement that God is giving to Israel. In the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Kings, Samuel, etc., here's the history of Israel's life under the Mosaic Covenant. And the threats and the curses and the promises make sense of all the cycles that you have there throughout Joshua and Judges, and then the good and the, and the wicked kings and the eventual exile of the various nations. This, this, this is God carrying out the Mosaic Covenant for His people. And the prophets... What do they do? They admonish disobedient Israel to keep the covenant. They threaten exile when Israel uh, will not listen. So the whole Old Testament is shaped by the Mosaic Covenant. It's the central covenant to the Old Testament. The very reason we call the Old Testament the Old Testament is because it's the record of the Old Covenant. Now, what contribution does it make to redemptive history? I've got five things here. Number one, here God claims Israel for himself. He's already claimed Abraham and Abraham's descendants, and he's going to come again now that they've become a great nation, and he's going to claim Israel for himself. Listen to Exodus 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go. And with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. And then also, when they get to Sinai, chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. God in the Mosaic Covenant is claiming Israel for himself. Number two, God governs Israel's life. God governs Israel's life. Read through Exodus 20 through 23, the Ten Commandments and then all the judgments that follow. Read all those laws. That's God telling the people of Israel, I- I'm governing. I'm governing every aspect of your life. I'm going to tell you what to do. Read Leviticus 11 through 27. Food laws, clothing laws. You know, God saying, here's what you're to eat, here's what you're not to eat, here's how you're to deal with the uncleanness in your midst. This is not God being mean, all right? This, the, the covenant with Moses is we're, negative things are said about it in the New Testament. It's, it brings death, it kills, it's a ministry of condemnation. It's not because it's got a lot of rules, that's not the reason. All right, this, this is God c- claiming these people for himself and being their God. The new covenant doesn't get better because it's less invasive. Okay, God is still our God. He still governs our life. But he's very clear in all these commandments. I'm going to tell you what to do from beginning to end. Read Deuteronomy 5 through 26. Number three, God regulates Israel's worship. 